Translators and Authors' Prefaces and Introduction to The Essay on the Creative Imagination by Théodule Ribot, translated from the French by Albert H. N. Barron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Translator's Preface The name of Théodule Ribot has been for many years well known in America, and his works have gained wide popularity. The present translation of one of his more recent works is an attempt to render available in English what has been received as a classic exposition of a subject that is often discussed, but rarely with any attempt to understand its true nature. It is quite generally recognized that psychology has remained in the semi-mythological, semi-scholastic period longer than most attempts at scientific formalization. For a long time it has been the spook science, per se, and the imagination, now analyzed by M. Ribot in such a masterly manner, has been one of the most persistent, apparently real, though very indefinite, of psychological spooks. Whereas people have been accustomed to speak of the imagination as an entity sui generis, as a lofty something found only in long-haired, wild-eyed geniuses, constituting indeed the center of a cult, our author, Prometheus-like, has brought it down from the heavens, and has clearly shown that imagination is a function of mind common to all men in some degree, and that it is shown in as highly developed form in commercial leaders and practical inventors as in the most bizarre of romantic idealists. The only difference is that the manifestation is not the same. That this view is not entirely original with M. Ribot is not to his discredit. Indeed, he does not claim any originality. We find the view clearly expressed elsewhere certainly as early as aristotle that the greatest artist is he who actually embodies his vision and will in permanent form preferably in social institutions this idea is so clearly enunciated in the present monograph which the author modestly styles an essay that when the end of the book is reached but little remains of the great imagination ghost save the one great mystery underlying all facts of mind that the present rendering falls far below the lucid french of the original the translator is well aware. He trusts, however, that the indulgent reader will take into account the good intent as offsetting in part, at least, the numerous shortcomings of this version. I wish here to express my obligation to those friends who encouraged me in the congenial task of translation. A. H. N. B. Author's Preface Contemporary psychology has studied the purely reproductive imagination with great eagerness and success. The works on the different image groups, visual, auditory, tactile, motor, are known to everyone, and form a collection of inquiries solidly based on subjective and objective observation, on pathological facts, and laboratory experiments. The study of the creative or constructive imagination, on the other hand, has been almost entirely neglected. It would be easy to show that the best, most complete, and most recent treatises on psychology devote to it scarcely a page or two, often, indeed, do not even mention it. A few articles, a few brief, scarce monographs, make up the sum of the past twenty-five years' work on the subject. The subject does not, however, at all deserve this indifferent or contemptuous attitude. Its importance is unquestionable, and even though the study of the creative imagination has hitherto remained almost inaccessible to experimentation, strictly so called, there are yet other objective processes that permit of our approaching it with some likelihood of success, and of continuing the work of former psychologists, but with methods better adapted to the requirements of contemporary thought. The present work is offered to the reader as an essay or first attempt only. It is not our intention here to undertake a complete monograph that would require a thick volume, but only to seek the underlying conditions of the creative imagination, showing that it has its beginning and principal source in the natural tendency of images to become objectified, or, more simply, in the motor elements inherent in the image, and then following in its development under its manifold forms, whatever they may be. For I cannot but maintain that, at present, the psychology of the imagination is concerned almost wholly with its part in aesthetic creation and in the sciences. We scarcely get beyond that. Its other manifestations have been occasionally mentioned, never investigated. Yet invention in the fine arts and in the sciences is only a special case, and possibly not the principal one. We hope to show that in practical life, 
in mechanical military industrial and commercial inventions in religious social and political institutions the human mind has expended and made permanent as much imagination as in all other fields the constructive imagination is a faculty that in the course of ages has undergone a reduction or at least some profound changes so for reasons indicated later on the mythic activity has been taken in this work as the central point of our topic as the primitive and typical form out of which the greater number of the others have arisen the creative power is there shown entirely unconfined freed from all hindrance careless of the possible and the impossible in a pure state unadulterated by the opposing influence of imitation of ratiocination of the knowledge of natural laws and their uniformity in the first or analytical part we shall try to resolve the constructive imagination into its constitutive factors and study each of them singly the second or genetic part will follow the imagination in its development as a whole from the dimmest to the most complex forms finally the third or concrete part will be no longer devoted to the imagination but to imaginative beings to the principal types of imagination that observation shows us may nineteen hundred introduction the motor nature of the constructive imagination it has been often repeated that one of the principal conquests of contemporary psychology is the fact that it has firmly established the place and importance of movements that it has especially through observation and experiment shown the representation of a movement to be a movement begun a movement in the nascent state yet those who have most strenuously insisted on this proposition have hardly gone beyond the realm of the passive imagination they have clung to the facts of pure reproduction my aim is to extend their formula and to show that it explains in large measure at least the origin of the creative imagination let us follow step by step the passage from reproduction pure and simple to the creative stage showing therein the persistence and preponderance of the motor element in proportion as we rise from mere repetition to invention first of all do all representations include motor elements yes i say because every perception presupposes movements to some extent and representations are the remnants of past perceptions certain it is that without our examining the question in detail this statement holds good for the great majority of cases so far as visual and tactile images are concerned there is no possible doubt as to the importance of the motor elements that enter into their composition the eye is very poorly endowed with movements for its office as a higher sense organ but if we take into account its intimate connection with the vocal organs so rich in capacity for motor combinations we note a kind of compensation smell and taste secondary in human psychology rise to a very high rank indeed among many animals and the olfactory apparatus thus obtains with them a complexity of movements proportionate to its importance and one that at times approaches that of sight there yet remains the group of internal sensations that might cause discussion setting aside the fact that the vague impressions bound up with chemical changes within the tissues are scarcely factors in representation we find that the sensations resulting from changes in respiration circulation and digestion are not lacking in motor elements the mere fact that in some persons vomiting hiccups micturation etc can be caused by perceptions of sight or of hearing proves that representations of this character have a tendency to become translated into acts without emphasizing the matter we may then say that this thesis rests on a weighty mass of facts that the motor element of the image tends to cause it to lose its purely inner character to objectify it to externalize it to project it outside of ourselves it should however be noted that what has just been said does not take us beyond the reproductive imagination beyond memory all these revived images are repetitions but the creative imagination requires something new this is its peculiar and essential mark in order to grasp the transition from reproduction to production from repetition to creation it is necessary to consider other more rare and more extraordinary facts found only among some favored beings these facts known for a long time surrounded with some mystery and attributed in a vague manner to the power of the imagination have been studied in our own day with much more system and exactness for our purpose we need to recall only a few of them many instances have been reported of tingling 
or of pains that may appear in different parts of the body solely through the effect of the imagination certain people can increase or inhibit the beating of their hearts at will that is by means of an intense and persistent representation the renowned physiologist e f weber possessed this power and has described the mechanism of this phenomenon still more remarkable are the cases of vesication produced in hypnotized subjects by means of suggestion finally let us recall the persistent story of the stigmatized individuals who from the thirteenth century down to our own day have been quite numerous and present some interesting varieties some having only the mark of the crucifix others of the scourging or of the crown of thorns let us add the profound changes of the organism results of the suggestive therapeutics of contemporaries the wonderful effects of the faith cure that is the miracles of all religions in all times and in all places and this brief list will suffice to recall certain creative activities of the human imagination that we have a tendency to forget it is proper to add that the image acts not altogether in a positive manner sometimes it has an inhibitory power a vivid representation of a movement arrested is the beginning of the stoppage of that movement it may even end in complete arrest of the movement such are the cases of paralysis by ideas first described by reynolds and later by charcot and his school under the name of psychic paralysis the patient's inward conviction that he cannot move a limb renders him powerless for any movement and he recovers his motor power only when the morbid representation has disappeared these and similar facts suggest a few remarks first that we have here creation in the strict sense of the word though it be limited to the organism what appears is new though one may strictly maintain that from our own experience we have a knowledge of formication rapid and slow beating of the heart even though we may not be able ordinarily to produce them at will this position is absolutely untenable when we consider cases of vesication stigmata and other alleged miraculous phenomena these are without precedent in the life of the individual second in order that these unusual states may occur there are required additional elements in the producing mechanism at bottom this mechanism is very obscure to invoke the power of the imagination is merely to substitute a word where an explanation is needed fortunately we do not need to penetrate into the inmost part of this mystery it is enough for us to make sure of the facts to prove that they have a representation as the starting point and to show that the representation by itself is not enough what more then is needed let us note first of all that these occurrences are rare it is not within the power of everybody to acquire stigmata or to become cured of a paralysis pronounced incurable this happens only to those having an ardent faith a strong desire that it shall come to pass this is an indispensable psychic condition what is concerned in such a case is not a single state but a double one an image followed by a particular emotional state desire aversion etc in other words there are two conditions in the first are concerned the motor elements included in the image the remains of previous perceptions in the second there are concerned the foregoing plus effective states tendencies that sum up the individual's energy it is the latter fact that explains their power to conclude this group of facts shows us the existence beyond images of another factor instinctive or emotional in form which we shall have to study later and which will lead us to the ultimate source of the creative imagination i fear that the distance between the facts here given and the creative imagination proper will seem to the reader very great indeed and why so first because the creative activity here has as its only material the organism and is not separated from the creator then too because these facts are extremely simple and the creative imagination in the ordinary sense is extremely complex here there is one operating cause a single representation more or less complex while in imagination creation we have several cooperating images with combinations coordination arrangement grouping but it must not be forgotten that our present aim is simply to find a transition stage between reproduction and production to show the common origin of the two forms of imagination the purely representative faculty and the faculty of creating by means of the intermediation of images and to show at the same time the work of separation of severance between the two two since the chief aim of this study is to prove that the basis of invention must be sought in motor manifestations 
I shall not hesitate to dwell on it, and I take the subject up again under another, clearer, more precise, and more psychological form, in putting the following question. Which one among the various modes of mind activity offers the closest analogy to the creative imagination? I unhesitatingly answer, voluntary activity. Imagination in the intellectual order is the equivalent of will in the realm of movements. Let us justify this comparison by some proof. 1. Likeness of development in the two instances. Growth of voluntary control is progressive, slow, crossed, and checked. The individual has to become master of his muscles and by their agency extend his sway over other things. Reflexes, instinctive movements, and movements expressive of emotion constitute the primary material of voluntary movements. The will has no movements of its own as an inheritance. It must coordinate and associate, since it separates in order to form new associations. It reigns by right of conquest, not by right of birth. In like manner, the creative imagination does not rise completely armed. Its raw materials are images, which here correspond to muscular movements. It goes through a period of trial. It always is, at the start, for reasons indicated later on, an imitation, it attains its complex forms only through a process of growth. 2. But this first comparison does not go to the bottom of the matter. There are yet deeper analogies. First, the completely subjective character of both instances. The imagination is subjective, personal, anthropocentric. Its movement is from within outwards toward an objectification. The understanding, that is, the intellect in the restricted sense, has opposite characteristics. It is objective, impersonal, receives from the outside. For the creative imagination, the inner world is the regulator. There is a preponderance of the inner over the outer. For the understanding, the outside world is the regulator. There is a preponderance of the outer over the inner. The world of my imagination is my world, as opposed to the world of my understanding, which is the world of all my fellow creatures. On the other hand, as regards the will, we might repeat exactly, word for word, what we have just said of the imagination. This is unnecessary. Back of both, then, we have our true cause, whatever may be our opinion concerning the ultimate nature of causation and will. 3. Both imagination and will will have a teleological character, and act only with a view toward an end, being thus the opposite of the understanding, which, as such, limits itself to proof. We are always wanting something, be it worthless or important. We are always inventing for an end, whether in the case of a Napoleon imagining a plan of campaign or a cook making up a new dish. In both instances there is now a simple end attained by immediate means, now a complex and distant goal presupposing subordinate ends, which are means in relation to the final end. In both cases there is a vis a tergo designated by the vague term spontaneity, which we shall attempt to make clear later, and a vis affronti, an attracting movement. 4. Added to this analogy as regards their nature, there are other, secondary likenesses between the abortive forms of the creative imagination and the impotent forms of the will. In its normal and complete form, will culminates in an act, but with wavering characters and sufferers from abulia, deliberation never ends, or the resolution remains inert, incapable of realization, of asserting itself in practice. The creative imagination also, in its complete form, has a tendency to become objectified, to assert itself in a work that shall exist not only for the creator, but for everybody. On the contrary, with dreamers pure and simple, the imagination remains a vaguely sketched inner affair. It is not embodied in any aesthetic or practical invention. Reverie is the equivalent of weak desires. Dreamers are the abulix of the creative imagination." It is unnecessary to add that the similarity established here between the will and the imagination is only partial, and has as its aim only to bring to light the role of the motor elements. Surely no one will confuse two aspects of our psychic life that are so distinct, and it would be foolish to delay in order to enumerate the differences. The characteristic of novelty should by itself suffice, since it is the special and indispensable mark of invention, and for volition is only accessory. The extraction of a tooth requires of the patient as much effort the second time as the first, although it is no longer a novelty. 
after these preliminary remarks we must go to the analysis of the creative imagination in order to understand its nature in so far as that is accessible with our existing means it is indeed a tertiary formation in mental life if we assume a primary layer sensations and simple emotions and a secondary images and their associations certain elementary logical operations etc being composite it may be decomposed into its constituent elements which we shall study under these three headings namely the intellectual factor the affective or emotional factor and the unconscious factor but that is not enough the analysis should be completed by a synthesis all imaginative creation great or small is organic requires a unifying principle there is then also a synthetic factor which it will be necessary to determine end of introduction end of prefaces and introduction